Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we're having uh, Marvin Tan, um, who is a visiting student here at um, University of Bristol uh, from Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. Is that uh, the right? Uh, That's perfect. Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe we can do it with a German accent. Um, I think the accent was already perfect, Ludwig Maximilians University. Ludwig Maximilians. So it's yeah, well, uh, okay, so uh, Marvin has been with us now for a few months now, and uh, we're excited for him to present the project that he's working on here um, with the other uh, lab members, um, and uh, Christoph needs to be admitted. So, uh, <laughs> and yeah, uh, so Marvin, is uh, are you more than welcome to start sharing the screen and um, take this uh, from here. Thank you very much, Almok, for this welcoming introduction. And by the way, thank you all for having me for these six months and the presentation today. I will just see that. Are we um, supposed to see a blank white page? Yeah. Yes, that's intentional. Oh, okay. I would, I'm just trying to rearrange the view here. Just as a metaphor for TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's roughly my mind right now. Yeah. Um, just kidding. Um, you see, oh, that's curious. A black page? Yes, and a mouse pointer. That shouldn't be in there. That's almost mouse. But not both. Well, now it's my mouse. Okay, now it's, <laughs> now it's your mouse, mouse, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so today I will sort of give my halftime presentation, I would say. Um, on what I've been working on in the last three months. Um, it's been part of the GCSOBEX project led by Dawn. Um, and I will show you roughly the results to Che Young's and Lung's presentation two weeks ago. Um, but don't worry, I will also give a quick refresher for your memory so you don't feel lost. Um, so without any... Further ado, um, I will present an intervention, an inoculation intervention against vaccine misinformation on TikTok. As always, uh, please feel free to ask right away if you don't understand anything or um, if there's something you might feel worth adding so we can engage in a conversation. And um, I don't know why, but this is probably what I should have looked like when doing the analysis. At least that's what the PowerPoint AI thought. Um, very stylish, I would say. So let's, let's dive into that. Um, what is TikTok? You should probably already all know that. So I will just very briefly introduce it. Um, TikTok is a social media platform for short videos. Originally, it was just for lip syncing and um, doing dance performances to music. And has grown to 1.2 billion users of today. And the interesting thing is, although it's just number six um, of the biggest social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp still being in the top three, two thirds of the US users are under 30. So it has a generally very young user base. And because I thought it might be interesting, I will just briefly show you the uh, most popular video on TikTok so you can relate a bit or you can have a, have a clear impression on what they look like. And I see I have forgotten. Hold on, this might only take a second. Okay, but I have to unmute right now for that. I got a Nimbus 2000. Oh. Like my costume? Yo, that's so cool. How are you doing that? I got a Nimbus 2000. Oh, I see. Here. Wait, is that my longboard? Oh. Longboardium Leviosa! As you <laughs> might have already guessed. Yes. As you might have already guessed, um, the should I stop sharing the sound or is it 
All right. I don't think it's it matters. It doesn't matter if there's no sound in the slides. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Um, so as you might have already guessed, the uh, most important thing why users watch these videos is just entertainment, just um, funny little clips, and receiving novel content. Meaning um, there is a for you page that where the algorithm endlessly determines the next videos and like just shoves it um, in the app. From a creator point of view, it's also pretty standard stuff. Um, they seek to expand the social networks. They, well, all try, or we all want to be some sort of rock stars or influencers at the present day. And they all feel like they have something to say and a lot of them probably have. Um, TikTok is mostly about dancing and lip syncing, as I've already said, but it has grown slightly. Um, so social activism or an, also takes place and um, it also involves sort of educational content that I will show you later. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has already also been um, a place where public health information was spread. But uh, what might be a problem with TikTok in general? It has been criticized a lot for not doing enough against hatred and cyberbullying, which is also always spilling between the analog and the digital world um, and not doing enough against misinformation. So for example, there has been or have been several cases of nurses, healthcare professionals um, openly opposing abortion laws, um, the so-called pro-life movement and no information from TikTok why this might be problematic or anything. Also, anti-vaccine campaigns, and um, the thing with the algorithm bias that you might probably already know from YouTube and stuff, the algorithm tends to feed stuff to people that um, uh, is very uh, is, is very much engaging them. For example, with due to emotionalizing content, which is one thing why misinformation is problematic. Um, but is it really that bad? I would like to um, look at two topics in particular with you. Um, one being the HPV vaccination, where um, Bash et al. have analyzed the 100 most popular videos on that topic and came to the conclusion that while the anti-vaccination videos had a higher interaction regarding comments and such, and focus more on the negative side effects, um, for example, feeling dizzy after the vaccination, et cetera. Um, the pro-vaccination videos focus more on science-based information. They delivered the sources in the comments and on the cancer prevention side, which is probably the reason why you might want to get an HPV vaccine shot. And interestingly, while healthcare professionals did not make um, that much videos as non-professionals did, um, they received disproportionately more likes. So um, these videos might have been already very interesting to the audience, very pleasing for them. Um, and then the COVID pandemic was also a pretty interesting case where influencers got active they promoted sticking to the guidelines, uh, wearing face masks and keeping distance. The interesting thing was um, that they used dance and music and humor rather than promoting, for example, proper mask use, which can be probably sort of problematic. If everyone wears a mask, but under the nose. So yeah, so much for that. Um, as there has not been a lot of research on TikTok, um, I, it was a bit hard to assemble literature, but I stumbled upon two studies that caught my attention and that I want to present in detail before I go to the methodology in this study. Uh, one being Lip Syncing and Saving Lives by Southerton. Um, she analyzed the community of healthcare professionals in the veins of the COVID-19 pandemic. She did that by 
conducting an ethnographical analysis of six healthcare professionals, three being doctors and two being nurses from TikTok. And I will show you a short clip of one of them so you can get an impression what he's doing. He's uh, Karan Raj, has 2.8 million followers and usually uh, specializes on explaining unusual surgical procedures or niche medical conditions. But he also engaged with the um, COVID-19 anti-vaxxers and debunked their arguments, so to say. Um, just if someone does not want to see it, this um, will involve him explaining a bowel cancer operation. So uh, this takes roughly 20 seconds. And we removed a bowel cancer on the left side of their colon. I stitched the colon back onto the colon like two pipes. When you do bowel cancer operations and you remove the cancer and you join the two remaining cut ends of the intestine back together, there's one risk we always warn patients about. And that risk could be anywhere from 4% to 10%. There's a risk of something called an anastomotic leak. The intestines can just come apart. So, so as you might have already guessed, um, the videos were either following one of two premises. Um, this video is pretty much professional. He has some sort of studio, has a um, good microphone and explains while there are also shown picture overlays. The other premise being very amateur selfie videos out of the car or, or something. What they all have in common is they are affirming the author's authority by filming from the lab, filming um, in, in, in a lab code, or for example, using, well, medical terms. They, however, offer behind the scenes glimpses, meaning they um, take you to lunch, they uh, show raw emotions when a day goes not as expected, etc. What is also interesting is that all these influencers really engage into platform typical activities, for example, these dance challenges, duets, et cetera. And they really engage with the audience by um, showing, uh, by, by commenting, giving real advice, et cetera. Um, while this study is certainly very limited, keep in mind it was six people with an ethnographical analysis, I think we can sort of draw inspiration for the discussion later on that. And the other study being misinformation on TikTok by McDonald, one of Gordon Pencook's students. Um, she wanted to um, analyze mis or evaluate misinformation in inoculation against misinformation on TikTok, sorry. Um, so she conducted an experiment with 1,100 participants that were randomly assigned to one of three groups. Misinformation video, um, just the debunking video, or a misinformation video then followed by the debunking, so classical inoculation, and which was interesting. While the inoculation group um, had a decrease in vaccine misinformation, in belief in vaccine misinformation, the misinformation or debunking only groups did not significantly differ. So this is probably in what? How is that possible? In their reducing of vaccine misinformation uh, and in belief in vaccine misinformation. In believing in believing or in, in spreading? In believing. In believing in vaccine misinformation, yeah. So this is certainly a pretty big limitation <laughs> that. Well, I find the result hard to believe. I mean, that debunking what? and works, but inoculation doesn't. Well, I mean, <clears throat> is the debunking information the same in the in the two conditions where it is shown? The um, as and far as I know, it was. So how can it be the case that if I misinform you and then debunk you? You believe the misinformation less than if I just debunk you. I mean, you haven't seen the misinformation if I only debunk you. There's something funny there. 
I would say so too. Yeah. yeah. I would I would also say this is um some pretty weird um study and something we might keep in mind or might want to keep in mind that there could be something funny going on with video only interventions on TikTok because YouTube and interven video interventions certainly seem to work. Okay, so moving on, what could be the solutions? Um, obviously inoculation. And um, for that, the videos should be enjoyable. Um, so they would receive engagement, they would be upvoted by the algorithm. And obviously they should do their, well, pro provide to the main cause or um, do what they're made for. They should reduce vaccine hesitancy, obviously. Um, so while we did not have healthcare experts at hand, we certainly had the core audience of TikTok um, who we could teach to make these videos. So we, or probably <laughs> the others from the, um, from the group, um, conducted experiments in the summer where they taught the um, young young adults or adolescents um, to make inoculation videos. They um, brainstormed on topics and on potential potential strategies. And well, out of that resulted four videos. You might remember this in detail from two weeks ago. Um, therefore, I will not show you every video. You have probably already seen video number three. I will show you, therefore I will only show you video number one and number two, um, because they might be of interest later. Um, okay. Confused? It's not just you. Everyone who takes the vaccine is not just protecting themselves, but reducing their transmission uh, to other people and allowing society to get back to normal. Um, our vaccines are working exceptionally well. They continue to work well for Delta with regard to severe illness and death, they prevent it. But what they can't do anymore is prevent transmission. So I see people asking why the discrepancy and I get it, it's confusing. How do we know if we can trust something that keeps changing? We got to remember though, that actually things are always changing and we adapt. With the COVID vaccines, we really wanted it to stop transmission and to stop serious illness. And for a while it did stop transmission, but then COVID mutated, so things change, scientists adapt. But one really good thing we do have now is solid evidence and more data that shows two things. Vaccines are safe and they really make COVID a less risky disease. So even as we try and figure out how to deal with transmission, we can at least trust that vaccines are one good way to protect ourselves. Like a Superman Clark Kent thing with Don in the glass. This is going to be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, moving on to video number two. Um, Stop scrolling. They're trying to take away your freedom. Now that I've got your attention, let's unpack what just happened there. Bold statements like they're trying to control you or your freedom is under threat is often used to make people feel like they're about to lose control over the decisions in their lives. This feeling is what? known as reactant. And people who spread misinformation online might use it to persuade you about their message and to grab your attention. You might be more likely to watch that entire video and therefore it makes the misinformation more likely to spread. Before you share or believe a video that you see online, just think to yourself if they're using reactants against you. Okay, these were the two videos, obviously um, not starring the um, young participants, but some of, uh, some of the group, um, because it might have been a bit problematic to show uh, underage or yeah to let's to bring everything underway for that study so this resulted in a several hypotheses um we hypothesized that um the inoculation videos would be significantly better 
and reducing vaccine hesitancy than the control videos, while also differing amongst each other. Furthermore, they would significantly differ in their level of engagement from the control video and amongst each other. To test that, we recruited 510 participants via Prolific uh, in the age between 18 and 24 years. Um, this was because most of the um, users of TikTok were pretty young, up to mid-20, and well, using and paying underage people for the study would have resulted in bureaucratic hurdles. So we then um, let them participate in a pre-post-test experiment. In the pre-test, they fill in the 5C scale, um, which was recoded to resemble vaccine acceptance rather than vaccine hesitancy. This means um, a higher result resembles higher or more acceptance for vaccines. Um, and the individual items being complacency that you don't have to get vaccinated because the vaccine preventable diseases are pretty rare. Um, feeling collective responsibility by or driving you to get vaccinated. Everyday constraints holding you back from uh, getting vaccinated. Uh, weighing benefits and problems of a um, vaccination and your confidence in vaccines. Okay. Also, there, were, there was the vaccination scale, which we constructed for a younger audience, which was also recoded to resemble vaccine um, confidence, so vaccine ac acceptance, and obviously the demographics. After that, the participants received one of five videos, four being the intervention videos and number five being a nice control video about daylight savings time. In the post-test, once again, they filled in the 5C and vaccination scale. They taught us, told us a lot about um, their TikTok usage, which I won't cover here because it's part of another study. And they showed us or indicated the video engagement, whether they would comment, uh, like and share a video when they enjoyed it. And they could also indicate why a button when they would have skipped past the video while watching it. Okay, let's dive into the results. Uh, can I ask a quick yes. question about the, the videos? I'm a little, um, so what's Steve Jobs again? What was? <laughs> oh, sorry, that was just um, what came to mind first. Uh, the video that was um, showing Steve Jobs on the left and the Mm, um, yeah, this was Bill right. Gates. Oh my, yes, it was Bill Gates. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. I meant okay, I meant Bill Gates true. when I wrote Steve Jobs. That's uh, <laughs> totally right. Uh, that's that's picked up misinformation right there. <laughs> Attention check um, successfully passed. <laughs> so that was all in purpose. <laughs> I'm the only one who picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> Only less to say we also included attention checks in that study. <laughs> okay, here we go for the results. Um, you might already see that there was not much of a difference between pre and post test for the 5C as well as for the vaccination scale. But there was one thing um, for the collective item, there is a significant improvement from pre, pre to post test. So even though the effect sizes are small, like the, part the participants felt a bit more collective responsibility after receiving the intervention. <laughs> okay. Um, regarding the covariates, um, you can see that the gender effects um, mean Women felt um, less complacency, like the complacency improved higher for them. Uh, they felt more collective responsibility and they um, had more vaccine acceptance than men after the interventions. 
Um, younger people felt a higher decrease in constraints as well as a bigger growth in acceptance and higher enjoyment led to a high decrease of constraints. Um, on the bottom, you can see just honorable mentions. We also had age effects for the complacency item, which were not really significant, but uh, marginally, I would say. And sharing attention was also a marginally significant covariate for um, reducing constraints. So, as there have been small differences um, between the control and intervention videos, um, we should also look at the individual videos in detail, I would say. And here we can see that there are already significant effects for the 5C scale from pre to post test. Once again, the effect sizes are small, but significant. Uh, I'm just, did you say you code the 5C scale so it actually is enhanced confidence, not hesitancy? Yes. So if there is a pre to post reduction for video two, isn't that the opposite of what you want? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I will come to that in, okay. in one second, but that's uh, absolutely correct. Um, so, to be more specific, the participants felt more collective responsibility after the intervention, and they also had significant interaction effects for the confidence. Um, but as we can see, video number two had a significant decrease in confidence, which is, um, I would say, could be problematic. Um, furthermore, for Video number two, we had a significantly smaller improvement than for video one in collective responsibility. And also video one was the only one showing a significant improvement in calculation or at all um, from pre to post test. Obviously, we have to crown a winner because it was a contest for youth. So um, for this measure, video number one is the obvious winner. And yes, it's quite problematic, I would say, that video number two decreased the confidence. I mean, could it be because video number two seems the message in general is can be taken as don't trust like anything because mm. yeah, could be so confidence is lowered by that because I don't know what to trust anymore in, in a sense. Where, whereas video number one message is quite kind of straightforward yeah. and talks about vaccines. So and it's more specific. Yeah, it's more specific. Yeah. Yes. It's definitely a good point in terms of what do we choose to inoculate against. Yeah. So I should mention that the workshops, we let the young people choose themselves what they thought was an important target to address. Um, but obviously, we didn't know what the targets really should be. And that's something we can probably think about in the future, especially when we're trying to address something like reactants, which, yeah, in itself, I don't know, does it, in, does it invoke reactants to the video? That's another question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, moving on from the effectiveness and reducing vaccine hesitancy to the question whether or how engaging these videos were. Once again, they indicated how much they enjoyed the video, whether they would share it, like it, when they would scroll past it, and uh, just on the bottom, whether they would leave a comment. Um, just... <laughs> Uh, sorry, I find it funny that people like enjoy more a video on daylight savings. <laughs> yeah, okay. It was a good video, I must um, say. <laughs> it was very engaging. Enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, um, that's one thing that comes to mind. And that lacking intention and when they would have scrolled past did not really differ. So overall, we have a significant difference in enjoyment, <laughs> but nothing else really. That doesn't hold if we look at the individual videos, because here we can see huge differences. Video one being on par with um, con the control video for enjoyment and the sharing intention, well, every other measures, like really differing. 
Um, this shows if we compare them to each other, uh, meaning that I hope you can all still read it. So um, for the scrolling time, video two once again scored significantly lower than video one and one. video three. We have to declare a winner. So in this case, it's video number four with 39.15 seconds. This is, keep in mind, only 57% of that video. Um, the second winner, video number one, with 38.96 seconds, had 63% uh, of the video being watched in the, on average. Uh, for the enjoyment, once again, video number one wins and somewhat the control video, I guess. Um, while video two, again, was significantly lower than the control video and number three and number one and number four. Mm. And video number three was sign enjoyed significantly less than video number one. Um, for the sharing intention, once again, video number one wins, just by descriptives, uh, while the sharing intention for video number one was significantly higher for, than for number two. And regarding the liking intention, once again, video number one wins, um, being significantly higher than video number two and three, and four being significantly higher than number two. Um. Why do you need statistics Pardon? at all for, for these? I mean, th this is just diagnostic for the uh, for the individual videos, right? You don't want to say anything about the population of videos, something, it's just those videos, right? Um, or do you want to know which video has more? In yes. Which, which video had the most engagement? Like, um... yeah, I mean, for descriptives, I don't. Uh, personally, I don't think that you would need like really a statistical analysis for it. Just like uh, uh, to to look at the uh, at the averages or the ratings or something. Um, I I don't know personally. I I I, I would think because um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on what you're trying to establish. Right. Um, what you're doing here, I think, is just. These, these tests are between the videos, right? That's why you have four degrees of freedom in the numerator, right? Um, yeah, I would sort of, I mean, I mean, I'm not offended by it, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it may not be. What I would probably do is uh, compute the, um, proper within subject confidence intervals, put them on the bar chart, and then let people have a look. And anything that doesn't overlap, you could say, yeah, that's statistically significant. But yeah, I'm not fussed either way. I mean, the problem is that with this, you just don't know if you're drilling into noise or whether you're picking up something, OK? Because the videos are so different from each other. The messages are different. The yeah. visuals are different. So who the hell knows what you're comparing? You know, you, you have a sample of four videos, you know, from a population of 10,000 or 100,000 or even more, right? And so what are you observing here? Is it systematic? Is it something to do with reactants? Or is it just that Lucine didn't smile enough? I mean, you know, you just don't know. Yeah, so I, I mean, one comment there is that, yes, we cannot determine what's actually causing the enjoyment. But if the question is, well, are inoculations at least as engaging as a control, or at least are the ones that we've managed to produce doing well enough compared to it? I do think the statistics are at least um, you know, relevant in that case. Okay. Yeah, look, I accept that. I accept that. Um, my, my comment was more of a sort of a meta comment. Right, that it is extremely difficult to to know how to interpret this or what to do with it be, because the variability is so immense between these videos. I mean, you know, ideally, what you would want is to get a hundred teenager teenagers to each do five videos, you know, with with a sort of a given script and let them loose on TikTok. Yeah. Right. And. Right. I mean, or, or something that you probably could do uh, is try to characterize the different videos on 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 different 
um, dimensions, right? Well, which is what this is, sort of, isn't it? Enjoyment, one of them. Uh, I'm talking about, well, you mean a more microscopic? I'm, ta I'm talking about the, um, not about the behavior, but what the description of, of the video, right? Wow. So, like, um, I don't know, the content, or um, if, if you would have to code it somehow, like yeah. think of some sort of a coding scheme, and then you could, well, well maybe have a more, I don't know, um, informed comparison or something. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, you're totally right. Like we uh, did not have a treatment check um, for what exactly they found most compelling in that video. Yeah. And um, this might be definitely something for a follow up as well as uh, you suggested. Um, doing as many videos as possible to... Yeah, I mean, in, in the ideal world of almost unlimited resources, that would, to me, that would be the only way to go, right? You, you just run a sort of a naturalistic evolutionary experiment, you know, you let loose 100 candidate videos on, on TikTok, and then you just see which ones get shared. And, uh, you know, they're the ones that you want to work with and the others you throw away. Um, right? That to me is, is, is um, as of course, it's extremely difficult to do. I mean, even in that case, you, we don't really know how the algorithm works. So sometimes you see an account with Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And there's one video that's viral and the other 99 that's not, and the content is always the same. So exactly. that that that's, that's, the, that's the other problem. Yeah. Well, you can cope with that, I think, by by having different, by seeing sure. different yeah. accounts to um, get things going. I mean, the, you know, again, this is all <laughs> high in the sky stuff unless Bill Gates gives you a million dollars to, to run this stuff, right? Or you get a machine to generate them. Yeah. The videos. Now there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a, it's a, yeah. You don't have you don't have to have someone who's actually integrating this, right? It can be also just text with some yeah. images and um and music. And this could be all or you just give a machine to do the voice over the bass. Well, well you could also use that. Yeah, I mean that's also possible. Yeah. yeah. So it could be scale though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, for video number four, that's it. I like that. So, in other words, sorry. I, so you get GPT three to run a hundred uh, versions of an inoculation video. Yes. That is then pronounced by a machine to yeah. to do a voiceover yeah. on a random video with random effects or. Yeah, just run some random variation. Yeah, generate random. Like, and then you let them. And then let, let, them, let them use. So, I love it. I think. And then you see what happens. <laughs> and then you see what happens. Holy cow, man. I mean, <laughs> what a time to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. OK, and video number four, winning regarding the commenting intentions, um, which makes video number one the overall winner for engagement as well as reducing vaccine hesitancy. But one thing bugged me because um, the commenting intention was pretty low for every video. Um, so we asked the participants simply why they would not comment and coded it after um, receiving the results. And what was pretty interesting was that most of them said they would generally not leave comments on TikTok, um, while the second biggest group said they feel like they can't add anything, they don't know enough. Um, they um, are, they have the same opinion, so there's nothing they could really contribute because it's already been said. Um, other people saying they were not interested. And what I also found very interesting was um, that only just below 5% said they wouldn't comment because they um, did not want to argue with anti-vaxxers um, because that's not the impression that I got from the literature um, where there was a lot of criticism on that problem per se. Okay, and yeah, also like a bit less than that would just ignore the video altogether because they thought it looked like that. Okay, to wrap it up. Um, 
we could unfortunately not be, see that much of a significant difference between the control and the inoculation videos at reducing vaccine hesitancy. We could, on the other hand, see significant differences for some measures between the different videos. At reducing vaccine hesitancy, we saw several significant differences uh, regarding the level of engagement between the inoculation and the control videos, as well as between the inoculation videos. Okay, which leaves us with one thing, because um, I would really like to do, or we plan to do a follow-up on this, and would really like to have your opinion on that. Um, I have uh, some questions prepared, but I get the impression that there are already opinions in the wild. So um, how should we do this? Would you like to say anything uh, by the top of your head, or should I just present what I had in mind? Yeah, you can. <laughs> OK. Um, one thing that kept or that was in my mind is um, that on the one hand, we're able to, or you are able to um, create effective interventions against um, vaccine or misinformation in general. While on the other hand, it looked a bit like um, these videos could not really reduce the vaccine hesitancy because or as well as um, really foster interest engagement in the videos. So I was thinking when we can create these videos, why can't we teach others to create them? Um, is there something we, we missed we might want to do better or different in the future? And as a general question, how could we produce effective videos on TikTok specifically, while um, YouTube already having several good interventions? So these are just wild thoughts that I had. Um, yeah, maybe they might be of use during the discussion. So should we like stick to the style of TikTok, engage in, I don't know, dance challenges, lip syncing? Um, should we use expert science like um, stethoscopes or something like that? Um, should we have misinformation expert science, whatever that may be? Um, should we like appear as experts or how should we be as experts to be more relatable to the general population? And should we in the long run um, Put style over content or vice versa? Like, should we risk to be to let these videos be not that engaging, but really um, cover our whole message? Or should we like sacrifice a bit of our message to make them more engaging? And yeah, which measures would you say are worth looking at in general? So, a lot of questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think the, are you. Is, I would leave that up in, is, yeah. is that the the final slide? For you? This is somewhat of the final slide before the thank you for your attention. Yes. Okay. Um, cool. So before we get thanks, I think Simon has a um, has his hand up. Oh yeah. <clears throat> if we're moving into questions now, is that okay? Yes, yeah. please. Um, I just wondered. Do we have a view of how congruous or incongruous these look in context of someone's feed on on TikTok? Because I mean, when, when we're talking about YouTube stuff, I kind of have a sense of how YouTube works and what type of stuff you get fed. And, and you kind of get a sense when you see the YouTube vaccination videos we've done that, um, that they would they would be relatively similar to what else you'd be watching. But do we think that's the case on TikTok or, or are these going to look vastly different to anything else that, that someone would be fed. 
So I can maybe answer that question, actually, having watched, like, uh, well, spent too much of my life watching them already. Uh, there's a huge range, even the ones that are dedicatedly anti-vax. And I personally didn't think any of the ones that we had created in workshops were entirely out of place. Um, yeah, basically, there's all sorts of things you get on TikTok from someone giving a lecture for 10 minutes now. Okay. Um, and the spicing videos and some people just sort of reiterating or talking at the camera so all of the styles that you've seen between this one and the ones Cheon and Luning shared can be found on TikTok so I hope that answers the question yeah absolutely thank you could I say something on that um is that as yeah. in because as as someone young person who uses TikTok a lot I'd say it really really depends on the person because like as as Dawn said you would see things like that on TikTok but I have never seen anything like that unless I'm searching for it so I think a lot of people especially like my age and younger and stuff that kind of video would be quite incongruous if it came up on our feeds um because it would be so very different so I think it really depends on obviously the algorithm differs for each person depending on what you've seen so I, I think a lot of young people wouldn't necessarily see videos like that on their feed um but yeah that's just I should maybe add that I was tasked specifically to look for health pe health videos from the perspective of someone who's really concerned of health and COVID so I got sent down a big rabbit hole of videos that were um, <laughs> kind of in that style or in the various styles like that Angela. Yes, uh, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think that I think this is related to what Mia was saying. I think like the the special thing of this experiment is that we are well, you are targeting uh, young people, and a challenge is to speak to them using their their, their language, right? And, and try to, to, to connect with them through TikTok, which is a very extravagant platform with very weird and bizarre contents, right? So I think one of the problems is that if I watch the video by uh, Mushin, for example, I know how smart he is, but because you are putting yourself in a, on, on an equal footing with other TikTok videos, someone may think, okay, this is just a guy talking to me uh, with a poster of Muhammad Ali and Bruce Lee shaking their hands. You know, I, I don't have any reason to respect this person, right? Uh, so maybe, I mean, Kath, did you, maybe one possibility would be to contact famous YouTubers, for example, mm -hmm. and try oh, to- Sorry, contact who? Famous yeah. YouTubers. <laughs> famous oh, yeah. YouTubers, I don't know, or in this case, TikTokers. Social yeah. media influencers. Yeah. Social media influencers and try to, you know, to, to make them participate and using their own language. Uh, maybe their engagement will be far better than just this kind of videos. Right? Maybe you need the help of someone who is speaking to this very particular group of people with very particular interests and uh, languages, right? I mean, that, that, that could be a nice follow-up study, right? To, to see if, if the effect of a TikToker inoculating their for, if the, the followers is greater than just a, a random person talking. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Angela, I, yeah, I think it's a good point. And it leads on to this, I guess, the issue I already raised, which is that we are in a space where the the possibly the main drivers of behavior have nothing to do with inoculation or what we're trying to achieve, but are the visuals and the music and the, you know, the, the whatever, the acting, I mean, who knows, right? And, and that's, of course, what is so challenging about working in this area. And yeah, talking to influencers is probably one way to go. That's sort of the opposite of the random, yeah, the shotgun. Approach. Exactly. This is what exactly was my thought that it's either yeah. to to gain on domain expertise or to go yes. bottom up. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So this is exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it actually would be a very interesting, you know, hypothetically speaking, a great project to to have you know go deep with an influencer 
or go incredibly broad with GPT-3 and virtually random videos, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, not entirely random, but sort of yeah. you know, incredibly varied and, and see whether the distribution of GPT-3 videos overlaps with the, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of very interesting things you can uh, play with and you could even then maybe eventually just, you know, create a model of what predicts engagement yeah. with TikTok videos based on this ensemble of things you produce. But that's a massive, that's a, that's a you know, major grant in itself. It is a major grant, but I, I also think that it, 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 it's, you have here the assumption, uh, the assumption that the, what, uh, the, the problem with uh, the persuasion here is is the, the lack of engagement, and I'm not sure that this is the case because these are two different measures: whether mm -hmm. um, video is engaging and whether it is persuasive and and effective. And and you need to tease it apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, by doing something like we started talking about before, as like trying to map the different dimensions of the uh, of each ad or uh, say on on two clusters of the effectiveness and 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 the engagement right and then see how each ad is supposed to be um i don't know what, what would be the rating of each ad on the, on the different um the facet maybe that could tell you something about uh, whether you have a problem with your stimuli or whether there's it, it, it isn't decoupled like the uh, the and the effectiveness and uh, and the engagement because um, it might not and you just uh, don't know that and and as for the using domain expertise I think that 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 will probably increase engagement but we don't know what it will do with uh, exactly um, yeah. with persuasion right yeah yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you, you mean by domain expertise almost like someone dressed like a doctor? No, I, I mean like an influencer who's at the, oh, the okay. In, in you, the, you, you, okay, that that's yeah. the domain expertise in the TikTok context, right? Yeah, yeah, domain expertise. Yeah, okay. Domain expertise I thought you were talking about someone with the you know the aesthetics of a healthcare professional. Then that would yeah. be completely overlooked and ignored in TikTok. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Don, maybe you, you want to say something about your comment? Oh, yeah. I mean, so you're talking about it not being the lack of engagement resulting in lack of um, ability to inoculate. So I think, yeah, that's probably very well the case. However, if we don't actually get people to watch the things, it doesn't matter how, much, how many inoculation videos you put on TikTok. They won't work because no one's watching them. It's true. And the thing is, uh, the more engaging they are, like the engagement measures were essentially to, ex well, mm -hmm. exploit is a bit of a bad word, but to um, encourage the algorithm to to push them to a for you page, like to to, to let them spread more easily. So I think yeah. So Christoph has mentioned that influencer-based yeah. interventions might sort of get too tied to the influencer. And I think that's another thing mm -hmm. we consider yeah. with this whole citizen science approach, where if you can actually get people who are involved in TikTok, so all of these people who actually scripted and told us what to do and what to act. So this wasn't me or Mazine or Marlena who acted in it. We didn't come up with the ideas. It was the young people. Mm. Like the youngest was like 10. Um, the oldest was like 20. Most of them were between 10 and 18. Um, they were the ones who said, okay, do this, we want this, this is the, these are the images we want, this we or we want this animation or whatever, and we just sort of put it together. So we were sort of thinking, well, if that can work, we are actually training more of like collective ability yeah. to put these things out there. And that would have been very nice if it worked. And how, how many were in a group? Five in five in a group, uh, four groups of five. Four groups of five. Right. So yeah, I mean that's a that that's an interesting way of trying to harness like the collective power, and I think it it it, uh, it touches on the different um, a different issue like the crowdsourcing paper of Panicook and Rand and, and others, right? About uh, where you can equate um, uh, 
uh, layman and um, and domain experts. And this is exactly the trade-off that we were just talking, right? Of how many laymen do you need for an expert? Uh, apparently, in the case of TikTok, it might not like five may not be the uh, the golden number, but um, um, but it's it's just um, uh, but but it is a very um, it's very interesting like to try and and, and use this um, as a collective effort. Yeah. Ah, different. I don't think we have time to, to go into it, but I just wanted to, I don't know, kind of. Uh, oh, what time is it? Oh, we wait. have two more minutes, so yeah. I'm just going to just raise this question uh, because it's something that I also kind of uh, struggle with. And I think that part of the problem, right, with the post-truth era is that, um, you know, these um, individuals are more meaningful or at least um, as meaningful as experts. And this mainly relates to the uh, second question. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, should we generally as, as uh, scientists kind of like stick to our expertise and like really, you know, like um, be insistent on the fact that expertise is what counts. And, and in that sense, you know, only use doctors and only use, you know, like real experts, or are we kind of trying to kind of take the fight to the, like to TikTok and then you know, it, it goes back to what um, what you were discussing about uh, using influences or not, because an influencer would be very influential on like a personal level, but I mean, they're not an expert. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I, like I myself, I'm having like a hard time with this tension because an influencer would be much more convincing on the one hand, but that kind of goes against the scientific rationale of, you know, only experts have the answers and like influencers can either uh, you know, they can um, like mitigate the, the expertise or try and like, uh, you know, pass along the expertise, but the influencers aren't the experts themselves. So I don't know, I think that's kind of like a tricky kind of, of question, especially, you know, on TikTok, because obviously doctors are not going to be engaging and exciting or, well, not obviously, but most likely they won't be, you know, engaging and, and exciting, but they will have the actual, like the the best message. So I don't know, just kind of putting it out there because I'm also uh, debating it. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Deborah. I agree that there there is a tension there. And I I don't I don't have I don't know what the right answer is. Influencers sharing the expert videos. Yeah. Although I'm not familiar with TikTok, I don't I don't actually know how it works. Well, or quoting them. Yeah. 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 Oh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Something like that. You know. Yeah, but probably influencers well, so the affiliation between the audience and influencers. Yeah. I mean, there are uh, like influencers that share science, mm. and they're probably followed by people who are already willing to be vaccinated, mm. which are not our, it's not our target. But mm. if I follow Joe Rogan, <laughs> is, <laughs> is he on TikTok? I, I don't think he will share something like science based. Yeah. And yeah. Mm. there's also a problem of the experts becoming influencers themselves, and then you get those mm. the genre of Doctor yeah, Oz yeah. and Doctor Phil that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, and some of those, can, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, there's, yes. <clears throat> yeah, but that's, that's the only way to get viral in social media, I think. I mean, social media is a neoliberal jungle of supply and demand, and each bubble play with their own rules and they have their own language. And to enter the bubble, you have to, to, to talk with the person in charge, you know? Uh, so, I mean, if you want to access the, the, the followers of an influencer, you, 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 I mean, you, you need the help of the influencer. They are running the, that that platform. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, I, I think they are not not like general viral content now in social media. Mm -hmm. You have like this micro uh, virality within bubbles, mm -hmm. right? And there's another thing I'll maybe put out there, which is that with anti specific those you know the, that one's vested interest in getting anti vaccination content out there, they post loads of videos a day just you know spamming the system even though they know they're gonna take like a lot will get taken down because the more you post the more likely one ends up going viral like that's I think that's literally the strategy of some of them if what our discussions on this is has indicated is right 
the Simon's um, asked what it means to duet a video. So basically that just means when somebody posts a video, you can actually use that video and then video yourself together and uh, sort of alongside. I hope I'm explaining this right, Mia. Just it's like not a, an actual conversation, right? I mean, it's just like one-sided response. Yeah, it's a bit like responding to the original video. I, I hope I'm not oh, like how, how, uh, uh, how does that appear? Yeah. Sorry. Is that a split screen type of thing then when you're on one side talking about the video and the videos on the other side? I've seen, I mean, I think they can go into different places as well. But one key thing is that the original poster must have allowed it to be used that way. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, this is all very interesting. Yeah. And, but we're only three minutes uh, past the hour. So I want to thank Marvin for uh, his talk. Thank you. Yep. Um, and thanks everybody and I think there were really uh, interesting ideas in the chat and in the discussion so we could follow up on this. Um, we're continuing with uh, the professional development session uh, today uh, led by Angelo. So uh, if you're not uh, into talking about peer review, you, you can safely <laughs> log off now. Uh, and and we can uh, <laughs> let Angelo uh, uh, lead the discussion. Uh, um, so, oh, and I'll stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>